Hello friends and welcome to another episode in the Run Brighter podcast. I've got some exciting news. We have entered a new era in the Run Brighter podcast. This is the beginning of season two of the Run Brighter podcast. And for those who didn't listen to season one or haven't been able to listen to all the episodes, we had some amazing guests on, over 30, 35 guests on, I believe, and a lot of solo episodes where we were able to bring on a, little, a lot of different perspectives when it comes to tips and advice for runners, specifically targeted beginner runners, runners who struggled with consistency, but also advanced runners found a lot of value from the podcast. And, you know, I've been doing this Run Brighter thing since October of 2021. The podcast has been rolling for over two years, and it's been a lot of fun hosting the podcast on my own and be able to provide value to the viewers, the amount of people who had reached out to me with recognition and praise, you know, it's it means so much. But like I said at the beginning here, we are beginning a new era in the Run Brighter podcast. I'm excited to say that Colleen Mock, who if you're watching the video version, you'd see her, but if you're just listening in, will now be my co-host for the Run Brighter podcast. She's my girlfriend. We live together, so this is very convenient. But <laughs> Colleen, you know, if you wanna say hello and also like, feel free to explain the reason that you were willing to accept my very, very strong offer of joining this podcast. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for uh, having me. It's uh, yeah, we do live together. That's why I keep seeing you around so much. I guess that <laughs> explains it. Um, <laughs> all jokes aside. Um, I have been incredibly, um, excited to join the podcast. We really started thinking about coming together for the podcast, um, whenever we moved in because it does make a lot more sense. I've came on the podcast a couple of times, but this really kind of solidified whenever we were watching the Olympics and we started <laughs> recognizing how much we just enjoy talking about the sports, specifically um, athletics is what it's called in the Olympics, but track and field or any sort of running. Um, and we realized that we, we really like talking about kind of the ins and outs of the track and field events, so talking about the different Olympians, talking about the different athletes. And so I just was really excited. Um, and the idea came up again about us collaborating on the podcast and so you know wrapping up a 65 plus season one to start season two is what we're going on now yeah totally and something i do want to be clear about is the vision of the brand for run writer you know it's not changing at all from the beginning when i first decided to begin run writer my main goal was to build a running community, um, spread running throughout the world and give people, you know, honest education, motivation, entertainment at points, give them access to a lot of different perspectives and people who are doing amazing things within running. And so we still have that same vision. You know, I think something we have a really good opportunity for via this podcast now that Colleen will be joining as a co-host is to get her perspective. Um, she's an incredible runner and also just has a lot of understanding regarding like human behavior and also when it comes to the athletes in the sport who are doing it really well. I know that she has some strong opinions and passions there as well. And so, you know, I think of anything, this podcast the direction we're taking is perhaps a little bit more attention off of my personal running story. There will still be space for me and Colleen to share some updates about what we're doing and running, but a lot of it's going to be about what we're learning from other people, what's going on within the sport, providing a positive place for you to listen in, you know, in the frequency that we choose to drop, drop episodes about, you know, like I said, what's going on in the sport. But Colleen, you know, We've had you on the podcast at this point twice. If you haven't listened to those episodes, it's in season one, highly recommend giving it a listen. You know, the first episode was shortly after we started dating 
And the second episode was about her 100K, um, the day before it actually, just how she felt going into that race. But I would love for you to take another opportunity now that you are the co-host to provide an introduction of who Colleen Mock really is. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I'm gonna like take off like this mask. Yes, um, she's wearing a mask under. We're actually twins now. <laughs> yeah, now that the running shoes will come off, you know, the real Colleen comes It's actually, off. yeah, she's a, an AI robot here that <laughs> I, I finally was able to create. Now, just get into your intro. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I am Colleen. I have been a you know certified inconsistent <laughs> and beginner runner for a very long time um running has been in and out of my life for uh probably since you know junior high high school um and i've always been into endurance athletics of some degree i went through you know like a cycling phase i went through running in and out multiple times um, but a lot of that kind of transition, depending on where I was for school, what trails were available to me, and all of that, what I could do with my studies time-wise. Um, and so I am in the process still <laughs> of uh, getting my PhD in clinical psychology with an emphasis on geropsychology, so the psychology of older adults. and. Throughout that um, graduate training process, I really began to recognize that I was a more uh, efficient student, efficient clinician, um, all of the things, you know. I was better whenever I was running. That forward momentum that I gained in my running translated to being more successful academically and otherwise. And so it's something that I've made a point to stick with as much as I can because I notice that I do better whenever I am challenging myself physically and it helps me produce a lot of good thoughts, a lot of positive energy, and it teaches you, teaches you a lot about yourself as well. So that's kind of who I am in a nutshell if we were to like try and merge together clinical geropsychology and running, which typically does not go together, but if we were to like smush them together, that's what we got. Amazing. And, you know, I think it's also important for people to know like some of your milestones in running. So if you want to just give like a quick resume about like the races that you've done, um, I think that would be also really helpful. Yeah, of course. So I started running in high school and then promptly quit after one season and maybe two weeks of another season. Um, I came in dead last in a 5k. <laughs> I never dropped out, but uh, I definitely was not doing well. Um, and then I just started sticking with running as a way to try and stay in shape, a way to stay active, a way to handle anxiety and stress that I had. And again, that fluctuated off and on, and it wasn't until this past year um, that I really re-entered the realm of competitive running. And so whenever I did that, I, um, chronologically speaking, I first signed up for a 10K, but then ended up signing up for a half marathon that was sooner than the 10K. So I tried to do things in a normal order, but did not. And so I have done, at this point, I've done uh, three half marathons. Yeah, three half marathons. I have done a few 5Ks. I have done two ultra marathons, and I have yet to do a marathon. Um, but that will be changing because I have transitioned after the 100K into working towards uh, gaining some speed and focusing on just seeing how quickly I can do a marathon um, with the with the fitness that I have currently. So right now I'm in the Chicago Marathon training, but I've kind of been all over the place when it comes to races. Um, I get distracted and I like running, so I often think, oh, that sounds like a fun race and just kind of sign up for stuff. <laughs> Totally. Um, you know, I think what is 
very interesting about Colleen's running story. I think also, like, compared to mine, we have very different stories when it comes to running, is your story is a little bit all over the place. Um, it's not very structured. It's not very organized. And this isn't meant to be a shot at you. It is more meant <laughs> to say, hey, like, you don't have to have this perfect stepping stone journey. Like, it's okay, like, within running to be all over the place. I'm going to segue that into an introduction about me. I think my journey's been a little bit more structured. However, again, no, no journey is better than the other. It's about how you embrace your journey, how you grow from your journey. And for us, we're trying to inspire people with our journeys, but also other journeys. But for those who haven't gotten to take a listen to my previous podcast, my name is Sam Brighter. Um, like I said earlier, founded Run Brighter back in October 2021. However, I have been running since I was 12 years old, when we talk about like a competitive scale. Um, when I was 12, I was in middle school, naturally. Um, and it was eighth grade that I first got into running. The reason I was, that I decided to start running in the first place was I loved playing baseball. I was really good at volleyball also. Maybe not very good, but I thought I was very good at volleyball. Other sports like basketball, but I was definitely a bit delayed when we talk about going through like puberty and I was very short for my grade. So while I did have certain athletic abilities within me, I definitely was always, I felt like, behind the rest of my grade. I was young for my grade, but also just behind when it came to puberty. And so I was left without a choice in eighth grade, especially like after getting cut from teams in seventh grade and gained a little bit of weight to sign up for something, get involved in something, because those, you know, little leagues that I had used to be a part of you know, mom and dad weren't willing to pay for those anymore. So we got into track and field, <laughs> and I think I was, like, more of, like, a mid-distance runner when it came to eighth grade. I ran, like, the 400, the 800, and a little bit of the mile, and was very slow, probably one of the bottom two or three members of that team. And the one thing that I did enjoy, though, was, like, the social aspect, getting to know boys and girls across the school and just you know, feeling like I was part of something, feeling included, and also feeling like there wasn't a lot of pressure within what I was doing. Don't worry, that pressure certainly changed quickly. Um, once I got into high school and I decided to join cross country. Cross country, I thought, before I joined, was an opportunity to travel the country and be a part of a running team. Little did I know it was more local races, but I definitely <laughs> was pretty pumped to get into cross country. And Ninth grade, I was, again, horrible. I would run to Taco Bell and just was not a strong runner. Like, I was part of kind of the bad kids crew within running because it was the only folks I could stay with. But that summer, I decided to, like, put aside all the BS and just commit to running and really had a turning point after a year and a half of consistent running. And eventually, once I got into 10th grade, started really progressing nicely when it came to my mile times, my 5K times, all of that. And at that point was really when I was hooked and knew that running was something that I could be somewhat good at and make somewhat of an impact on. And, you know, outside of just being a good runner, I had also noticed some nice changes for myself. Um, I was always someone who struggled with tests and had stress and anxiety, as well as really the biggest problem when it came to you know, being in grade school was ADD and just like really struggling to pay attention. Also had auditory processing disorder. As you can see, we are a very mentally strong group of individuals here on this podcast. But, you know, I do think we actually are. Like, I say that in all seriousness because we have something that we both do that keeps us wise, keeps us sharp and really, you know, in it, I would say. And once I started committing my life to running, all the aspects of my life improved. My grades improved, my overall health and wellness improved, my energy levels improved. You know, when I was in middle school, like I was falling asleep in classes often. Once I started running, well, I had a lot more natural energy throughout the day, even when I was not getting a lot of sleep, right? And running has opened up a lot of doors between meeting some amazing people through running clubs. I've been able to coach teams. Um, I coached the local running club by me, but coached a middle school and a high school team, 
and yeah, now I've been running for going on 16 years here um, soon, and I've done eight marathons, probably five or so half marathons, enough 10Ks, 5Ks, and shorter that I would not be able to count those numbers. And I've even done um, one ultra marathon, which was a 50K, and pace during two different ultra marathons as well. So pretty proud of the resume. And, you know, I have a lot of goals that I'm working towards slowly but surely. So that's who I am as a runner. But with that said, enough about us. We just wanted to give you that intro as far as who you know your hosts are. We're going to now jump into the Summer Olympics. Yeah, the Summer Olympics. Um, I feel like I always like forget how much I love the Olympics, and then they pop up, and I'm like, yes, this is going to be my entire personality for the next like two weeks. Um, and of course, we can't forget the Paralympics are going to be starting soon as well. Um, but the Summer Olympics this year, I think I got to watch so many more events than in the past. Um, mainly because, you know, unfortunately, but like also very conveniently, I had COVID during part of the Olympics being aired. So I mean, got any extra masks in here? <laughs> <laughs> so like, I mean, what else, what else is a girl to do, but to lay on the couch and watch sports all day. Um, and I also, you know, conveniently got to miss out on all those 90 plus days in Denver with air pollution from fire. So, you know, woe is me. But um, I, I absolutely love being able to watch so many of the different sports. I know this is a running podcast, um, but like being able to, to check in on some of the other events too, you know, gymnastics, watch some skateboarding, some swimming. It was great. Um, there was a time where whenever I was able to get back into running, I like had you know, the treadmill had like the Olympics going. So I'm like running the most slow, easy paced run that I could be ever be doing. Watching like these elite distance runners just like absolutely crushing it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing the same thing even though I'm like a thousand percent not. But it made it a lot more enjoyable. Um, and so I just, I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, what about you, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I think let's even take a step back. I think what really warmed it up for us was that we committed to watching a lot of the events during the Olympic trials. So I, at that point, we kind of started understanding the character traits of really all the characters, all the athletes that were in the Olympics. You know, track and field specifically and, and running as a whole is a sport that struggles, in my opinion, a lot of times because People don't know the personalities in the people. When we talk about fandom in sports, it's a lot about connecting to someone. Maybe you're relating to that person or you're aspiring to be that person. And when we think about like the major sports in both America as well as globally, the basketballs, the baseballs, football, soccers of the world, um, you know, the way that companies build the personal brands of these athletes and the marketing that's put in our face as well as the entertainment buildup for these sports that exist is incredible and I'm a huge fan of all those sports however in running because running is not as widely followed and really known around the world and in the US specifically I think is a, a country that <laughs> It probably does not get enough credit for what it should be. As a result of that, it's sometimes hard to connect as a viewer, but us deciding to commit to the Olympic trials and to know the U.S. runners that were going in, and then an awesome Netflix documentary dropped perfectly timed right before the Olympics called Sprint, um, where we got to know some of the sprinters right on a higher scale. And then I was also motivated after watching that to understand who is in some of the different longer distance races and learn about where they went to college. And so I think we were both like very self-motivated to like learn about these runners and then also just sitting down and watching these races in their fullness compared to like the highlight reels, like, right? Like watching the previews of the race and everything like that and really just being focused, having your coffee in front of you and watching it you learn a lot of amazing stories and then these names start being memorized. I mean, I think before the Olympics, if I'm being honest, I could probably name like 
five to ten runners that were competing, now I could probably name almost a hundred. So I'm pretty committed, I think, as far as being like a, a super fan of the sport. I want to go to now like track and field events that are going on before the Olympics. I want to follow these athletes' stories. I'm following them on social media, like a lot more of them. And I think that if people were to give it a chance, they would also find that same value. And, you know, there's probably more people who run than who watch running. Whereas you take other sports, there's probably more people who watch those sports than who do it. I could be wrong on that statistic, but that's just like an assumption that I have, or at least the margin there is a lot um, in the wrong direction, I guess, when we talk about running. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the way that track and field though was represented broadcasted the way that the athletes themselves i think that was the top thing were able to speak about themselves and share their stories was like i'd never seen during the olympics and i think because of that the sport has a lot of great to come i uh, and like i said i want to just continue following it so yeah yeah and i think because you know, maybe because it was so easy for us to watch um, as many events as we did, or maybe this set of Olympics was truly just, like, a lot more memorable. I feel like there are so many things where I'm just like, yeah, I remember, I'm going to remember this for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I feel like I could easily name, like, three. Like, do you have, do you have, like, a top three? Top three, like, most memorable Olympic moments? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, um... You know, it's really tough because there was a lot of great ones and I'm going to be biased and probably side on the Americans a bit, but, you know, it's it's like supporting your home team, but maybe I won't only mention Americans here. I mean, I think one memorable memory would be Noah Lyles um, getting the gold in the 100. The biggest reason for that would just be simply because... First of all, the 100 is not like his bread and butter event. Really, the 200 is he's had a lot of success in that event as he's been working on the 100 more and more. But to be able to see really him put his head down the last few years from the stories and what I've learned about him and focus on an event specifically and be able to now be the gold medal winner for the U.S., which I believe was the first time that we've won gold in the 100, probably for like at least 10, 15 years, I think 20 years, is awesome. And the fact that that race was as close as it was, I mean, what was it, like point oh? It, it was, yeah, point oh oh five. Yeah, that's what I want to say. So, I mean... A thousandth. Noah Lyles yeah. didn't even think he... He didn't think he won the race because he's so used to winning by enough where it's noticeable. But this race, he had to keep his head straight because it was simply so close. And, and then they had to pull out that super useful, very distorted photo finish image that I'm glad they could figure it out because I wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I mean, the most <laughs> the most helpful graphic, though, to really like understand the progress of that race. Because when you're watching a 100-meter race, it's like, First of all, it's under a 10 second race, right? The winners, I think they got like 9.7. And so you, you don't have a lot of time to actually watch it. There's also like six to eight runners that you're kind of looking back and forth between and maybe you're mostly eyeing the runner that you're rooting for, but it's typically impossible to tell who wins when we have a race that's even, you know, point 0.1 difference. And so when we talk about the point 0.0, that's when it gets even crazier. But there was an image on Instagram that stuck out where it showed where everyone was, I think, at every like 10 to 20 meters of the race. And if you look at it, literally until that last 5 to 10 meters, Noah Lyles was not winning that race. It was literally until the last second of the race that he actually held the first place mark. And he was, you know, in second through, I don't know, third or fourth the rest of the race, which was really cool. Yeah, there are even parts where he was last, and I, like, I think the first 10, 20 meters, he was in seventh place, and I think something that has come up a lot with a finish is a lot of people have expressed confusion, um, because one of the other runners' foot crossed the line first, but whenever it's the 100 meters, um, what matters is when the runner's chest crosses the line. That's why you have the numbers, the bibs. Mm -hmm. There's a tracker on it that allows
awesome to know the exact time when the tracker, which is on your chest, goes across the line. And so that's how they were able to determine that to one one thousandth of a second. And so some of the pictures can be like a little confusing because you can see someone else's foot across the line or their hand. But what matters is where their torso is, where their chest is. And whoever's chest crosses the line first is the winner. Yeah, that's really good insight there. I appreciate you sharing that. So yeah, that would be my number one moment. Um, number two, and these are in no particular order, by the way. I'm just sharing <laughs> that that was one of the three. Uh, we don't need to rank because <laughs> I, I would need a lot more time to think about that. I know we're throwing this in on the spot here. <laughs> but number two would be the 1500 meter, like that whole race the in general. 15. The men's 15. Yes, thank you for uh, correcting there because <laughs> it's good to know. Both, both 1500 meter races were awesome, but the men's specifically... Um, you know, that was probably one of my favorite races I've ever seen of all time um, in general when we talk about distance running. The fact that everyone was talking about before that race, is it going to be Ingerbitson or is it going to be Kerr? And I remember there was a poll on Instagram about, like, who's going to win? And the two of their names were brought up, and then they are like, U.S. <laughs> and I put in U.S. As, as far as, like, my vote. I think there was also an other, because there's, of course, was other runners than, you know, the four or five that they quantified that as that I just shared. But, you know, I, I had to put U.S. because I, I knew that Hawker, he was definitely someone to watch out for. Um, there was races that... I remember seeing him do back in like 2021 where he had beaten Olympians and he was an Oregon stud. I, I'm a fan of Oregon track and field. Like I've got a bias there because of Prefontaine and that being my favorite athlete of all time. So like it was one of those things where I was like, I don't know this guy, but I want him to win because I feel like I have somewhat of emotional connection with him. However, there's no way he knows I exist, nor does he feel like he has an emotional connection with me. It's like a one-way street here, but yeah, I mean, he was who I wanted to win, and the kick at the end of the race, I mean, that last, I don't know, 40, 50 meters of the race, you know, he was, I think, still in, in third or fourth when, when they were coming around on that last streak, but he had those wide arms, that's kind of his his form, and you're just seeing him running literally... And literally, like, he was going to end his life if he didn't win that race. And it was just an incredible finish, an unexpected finish. Another gold for U.S. And a race that I believe we haven't also won in a long time. And so, just super cool moment. Yeah, and some backstory on those key players there. So, Kerr and Ingerbritsen. Kerr is from Great Britain. Yeah. And Ingerbritsen is from Norway. And... Ingebrigtsen holds like a number of um, number of records, as does Kerr. They kind of have this history of clashing, going back and forth. Everyone thought that they were the two to watch, and for a long time they were, and they got so entangled in their uh, in their own like race between Kerr and Ingebrigtsen that they let up this gap that allowed. Hawker to just like sprint through with that wide arm frame. If you watch the race, you can see that Ingebrigtsen and Kerr completely leave this opening straight down the middle of lane one um, for Hawker to come in. And then Nagus comes in in fourth place as well. Nagus is another U.S. runner who um, I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Uh, and Nagus also stated... We haven't talked much about the camaraderie, but he always loves running with Hawker. They enjoy spending time together. They enjoy racing together. And so um, I remember hearing Nagus was just like, all right, Hawker's going for it. I guess I better, <laughs> guess I better keep going. And so it, it was crazy to see, um, especially with how much, uh, how much just like back and forth there was thinking that Ingebrigtsen was going to win gold, and I think he came in fourth, even. Yeah, he dropped yeah. out into fourth. It was, he was, I think, leading, you know, that most of that last lap until yeah. that final stretch. He just lost it, but yeah. he ended up winning the 5K gold after that, so the, the man <laughs> can't be too disappointed. Right. I just think sometimes when it comes to that final stretch, that finishing speed, you either have it or you don't, and clearly he didn't have it on that day. Um, but yeah, I would say my last moment that I would like to acknowledge would probably be the woman's 4 by 100 meter 
relay. Um, I have never ran a 4 by 100 meter as a runner. However, it is one of my favorite races to watch. I think it is so exciting to just see four people run at a full-out sprint and the handoffs and the coordination and just like how little room for error there is in that race to be successful is critical and it's something like again I've never done it I'm glad I have it because the amount of pressure for that whole team right like yes you want to win for yourself but if you drop the baton if you don't run your time you know you're letting down your entire team that's trying to earn that medal right and the women's four by one you know the way that team approached it was absolutely flawless it was great to see Gabby Thomas be a part of that, who's a 200-meter specialist and won gold as well. So shout out to her there. But seeing Shikari Richardson at that last 100 just blow away the competition and that look yeah. <laughs> that she had, I, I just, like, I'll never, like, forget that visual of, of that face that is meme-worthy, that's, like, get a... A photo of that have her autograph it frame it up in the house you know type of you know of an illustration I would say that she put on I mean that was the face of art and you know her comeback story of not being able to run in the Olympics and then be able to come back and, and run and earn a silver medal in the hundred in a race that was super challenging and then to come back the next day super challenging by the way because there was rain and a delay and she had other issues with um, getting she was locked out. Yeah, yeah, she was locked out of the practice track. Yeah, and you could easily have that experience and then just be intimidated being the last leg of this race, where I don't believe they were even in first when she got the baton, to then come home at the finish. Yeah, it was just really cool to see. Yeah, and I mean, I think the the 4x1, the necessity of like perfection with the baton handoffs I say as someone who has never ran track and field, um, you can really see the perfection if you compare the women's 4x1 to the men's 4x1, in which the U.S. men's 4x1 was disqualified. Um, and so there's a lot that can happen. Um, you never know what you're going to get because running is so, like, there are so many factors, especially you throw in, you know, running just as yourself is unpredictable. Um, but running a four by one is just insane. And even with, um, someone running like the fastest 100 with a curve to ever have existed and still get the U S still get disqualified. It's just insane. Yeah. I think some of your memorable times, um, are some of mine as well, <laughs> but I, I definitely would expand on it's kind of cheating by like sneaking in some more runs uh, for a memorable event. But basically, anytime Noah Lyles like walked out, walked out, sprinted, jumps, flew out, um, I think that that just made for an incredible and very memorable race. Um, Noah, a lot of people have opinions on Noah, but Noah brings like this fantastic energy and personality to the sport, which is like exactly what the sport <laughs> needs, right? It has been like just this long standing, you know, just stream of people coming. They run, they run really quickly. You don't get to learn a lot about them. But no one really puts on this show, and people, you know, say that he's cocky because he states his goals, right? Um, and maybe his goals are really hard and really high, but, you know, if your goals don't scare you, they're not high enough. They're not big enough. And also, you know, Sam has talked about this on his podcast before, back in season one, <laughs> um, that part of holding yourself accountable is telling other people your goals, and so Noah putting out there what he wants is part of bringing in, actualizing, setting those goals, uh, you know, having it come to fruition. And that also puts you in a vulnerable spot, as you can see on just about any post that Noah posts. People give him crap about putting his goals out there. But that's part of it. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be able to be like, yeah, I didn't run my best, but I, at least I set my goal and you're, everyone's going to know if I hit it or not. Um, everyone's going to remember and Hey, you watch me race anyway. Um, 
I think something that we didn't talk about because we focused on the 100, which is like the most coveted race of the Olympics because it's incredibly hard to reach that speed in such a short distance is the men's 200, which also had some crazy upsets, um, speculation of it being because of Noah Lyles having COVID. Um, but that was just, that was also a crazy race. Uh, Noah Lyles was favored for the 200 because he was a 200 like dominant person as Sam mentioned, but it was an insane race. The ending of it was crazy. You know, he starts off, he still gets third in the entire world and then he is taken off in a wheelchair um, due to complications with COVID, which by itself is horrible. Um, but then he also has asthma too. And so then COVID with, COVID with asthma, you're sprinting as fast as you can. It's hot. Um, I'd imagine it's humid and <laughs> I don't know for sure, but that's that's was pretty unforgettable, and I think you can make the argument that just about any time Noah Lyle steps out onto the track, you're gonna remember it. Yeah, and I mean one thing I'll add here on this too. So for those who don't know, kind of why Noah Lyles has gotten some of the hate that he has, one big thing that has resulted in resulted in his hate is he had once came at the NBA National Basketball Association, right, and. Pretty much was saying how it's not impressive when NBA teams win the NBA Finals. They can't call themselves world champions because it's not the world, it's a, a U.S. league. Um, I wouldn't say I fully agree with his opinion on that. However, just because he says things that might be what he thinks doesn't mean that's a reason to dislike someone, in my opinion. And he does say some controversial things that... I think at the end of the day is all about trying to bring attention, love and passion to running. So I think me and him have a very similar mission. However, um, again, I realize we have a similar mission. He probably doesn't realize we have a similar mission, <laughs> but you know, his goal is to really tell people, Hey, like, I know you love these other sports, but running, it's a world sport. It's a sport where there's a lot of amazing things within it and it should get a closer look. You know, when you look at some of the different sports out there, oftentimes the athletes that build the sport and make it a big difference are the ones who say controversial things that show their passion for the sport. You know, you think about UFC, like Conor McGregor. He's done so many silly things and has caused a lot of issues in that sport. However, he's the athlete who makes the most amount. You know, Michael Jordan, he's got some questionable things about him too, about what he had did what he had done within the sport and his attitude and the way that he treated his teammates he's the most famous basketball player of all time right and so i think that's something that you should just note about no lyles um and yeah the whole covid thing was another controversy but he didn't do anything wrong like he was allowed to it was within the rules they for him said to be able to compete yeah and so just wanted to bring, throw that out there but carry on with your most memorable moments yeah sam i appreciate that i mean i think a theme that I gathered, right, is that athletes are human first, right? And so everyone says and does things that they might regret. Whether they are going to say it on national TV or not is a different story. Um, but that's just how humans are. And athletes are not going to be perfect just because they're athletes. Um, I was also going to say the men's 1500, but, you know, <laughs> I <laughs> can't just bandwagon with everything. So I'm going to throw out the men's steeplechase. Mm. Um, I believe it was the 3K steeplechase. Yeah. Yeah. The 3K steeplechase, I say this is memorable and I forget the race distance. <laughs> but, um, you remember it, the last part. <laughs> I remember the last part um, because what I actually remember most about it was the runner who fell and was knocked unconscious. Um, and the steeplechase... If you watched the rounds, there were a lot of like difficulties in a lot of the rounds with the steeplechase. And for those who don't know the steeplechase, I don't know the steeplechase that well either. But what I can tell you is that it is the event in which you are hopping over barriers called steeples. And then sometimes they um, jump in, they have a pit of water. <laughs> and um, so just imagine hard hurdles with. Pretty much each lap, there being a water pit. Mm -hmm. 
once. And it's my understanding you don't have to touch the water, but it's better if you don't touch the water um, because it slows you down less, but it's also incredibly hard to like jump that far to not hit the water. And the water also is like in this pit, right, for there to be water. So then like if you fall, then it really throws off your your feet. Um, and there are issues with like someone getting pushed outside of the steeple and had happening to come back around. There were people falling. In this particular instance, a man fell and was knocked unconscious. And people were happening to run over him, around him. They didn't quite know what was going on. Um, and I think that just kind of goes to show that running is a contact sport. It is a dangerous sport. There are multiple events in which people fell. I believe there's a 500 heat in which like four people fell at one time. It was just too A lot of pushing and shoving, yeah. Lots of elbows. Um, it just... It happens, and it's really unfortunate. Um, it can happen at any distance, but it's pretty its pretty scary whenever you're watching that. It's also incredibly heartbreaking. I mean, a thing Mu was knocked out of the Olympic trials because she fell during a final, and so she wasn't able to qualify because of that, and it was just, it was absolutely heartbreaking to see her fall. Um, thankfully, she wasn't injured, and she wasn't knocked unconscious, at least I should say. Um, but that definitely injures your psyche after having trained for so long and to have that happen. Um, and I would say finally, my third memorable event was watching the women's marathon. Now, I was able to watch this event live because unfortunately I have insomnia. And <laughs> I woke up at 12.45 in the morning, and by coincidence, the race had begun. Um, Let's I, note I also watched the men's marathon, because Colleen couldn't fall asleep the night before, and so... You couldn't either. I couldn't either, and she's like, we should go out and watch the beginning of the marathon, and then I watched the whole race, and then she fell asleep during, like, the six mile. Carry on. Me, I'm blessed today. Okay. <laughs> so, I anyway, <laughs> I went out to watch the women's marathon. Um, and it was really interesting because, one, I was super excited to see Fiona O'Keefe in her, you know, I guess second marathon that we know of um, after she had completely dominated in the Olympic trials. But by the time that I watched, um, was able to start watching, she had actually dropped out already, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, so I started watching about 45 minutes into the race, and she had dropped out. Just Probably. so folks know, by the way, she was an incredible, she is an incredible half marathon runner, so based on her success in the half marathon, she had the opportunity to participate in the Olympic trials in the marathon. Yeah, so her first ever marathon that she ran was the marathon at the Olympic trials, she ran such a good um, half marathon time. She ran a half marathon in one hour and 11 minutes that that half marathon time qualified her to do the marathon trials. And so the marathon that she raced at the trials was the only marathon that she had ever competed in. So she won and qualified for the Olympics the very first time that she ever raced a marathon. And so I was incredibly excited to watch her. And then I was disheartened to hear that she had dropped out due to injury, I think. Um, I actually don't know if I knew at that point, but it was later revealed due to injury. Um, and what was incredibly interesting about the women's marathon was that Hassan, who eventually goes on to medal, she had not just medal, she got gold, and she set an Olympic record on a marathon course which was the hardest marathon course in olympic history with 1400 foot of elevation gain so it was insane but she not only got gold and set those records but she also got bronze in the women's 10k and bronze in the women's 5k so she raced um i believe it was 40 miles 38 uh yeah just short of 40 yeah 38 miles in the olympics so in a two-week span she raced almost 40 miles against the top performing athletes in the entire world, medaled three times, got gold, set an Olympic record. Absolutely insane. Absolutely phenomenal. The final race for that, or the final, like, you know, five minutes of that race before 
Hassan finishes is incredible. There is, a, again, pointing out that it is a contact sport. There were some elbows that were being shoved. One of the women who was in contention with Hassan, and in contention means she was running at a fast enough pace in which she likely could have gotten first. She, it was up in the air. Um, they had wanted to see her and Hassan, uh, really everyone wanted to see them fight at the end, battle it out at the end, because everyone that was in that last lead pack, lead group, so about four runners that were out further than the rest of the other runners, they all were able to kick or at the last minute, you know, pull out more time, run faster, even though they'd been running, you know, four minute miles, five minute miles, four minute miles, <laughs> um, for such a long time. And so it was just, it was absolutely crazy. It was so exciting to watch the turn um, onto the kind of like the blue carpet um, for the final, final, you know, 100 yards, 50 yards. And to see Hassan set all those records, just absolutely dominate it. It was, it was crazy. It was insane. She did such a fantastic job. She's also just a very funny woman. Um, her post-race interviews are always hilarious. She brings a lot of humor into the sport. Um, and I like that as well. Similar to Noah Lyles, I like people that have personality. I like people that, um, want to have a legacy beyond just running. And I think that that's great. Um, you know, just running as if setting records is nothing. But I think that that was just fantastic. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, listen, I have ran... Mo Were you going to say something? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, sorry, I remembered something. So you might have thought that what I was saying about Hassan meddling in three events was crazy. And it is. She's literally the first woman to have ever done that <laughs> in the Olympics. There's been one other Olympic athlete to have ever done that. It was a male runner who I honestly can't remember his name and I feel bad about that. And that was like 70 years ago. <laughs> so one other person has medaled in three, like the 5K, 10K, and the marathon in one Olympics before. And then she turns around and did it like it was absolutely nothing and set records along the way. Just mind blowing. Sorry, I wanted to throw that out there to also just, she deserves all the accolades. <laughs> so she's earned them. I'm going to talk about them. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I mean... I've experienced running multiple races in a day, you know, when I was in high school, right? But I was running the mile, the two mile, maybe the four by 800. And after the first race, typically, you are not the same runner as you are in that second race. The third race, you're even slower, right? These events, when you are putting in 80, 90, 95, probably close to 100% effort for Hassan, I, I don't know, I can't speak for her, but at least 80% effort through each race that she did, your body breaks down in an incredible way that is not comfortable. And so I can only imagine how sore she was while running the marathon and after, but it would be really nice to know like her, her fueling strategy and really the way that she was able to recover. I mean, we see often within the Olympics, people running like the 5K and the 10K or like the 1500 and the 5K. And there's success there. You know, there's a few days apart in those races, as well as the marathon being a few days apart. But it's just to be able to do that race last after those other two races, it's a remarkable feat. Yeah, and so on that note, I think it could be good, Colleen, to talk a little bit about some of the things that we saw from this Olympics that runners could consider bringing into their own training. Maybe you and I are thinking of bringing it into our own training. Is there anything like top of mind from that marathon that like stood out to you? Um, and it could also be things that maybe like you didn't agree with as well. Yeah, I really liked the cooling strategy highlights that they talked about. The, um, the race was pretty hot. Uh, it started off and it was 75 degrees. So that's usually you want, uh, you want the temperature when you're finishing a race to get up to 75 and no more than that. But 75 at start is, is pretty, pretty challenging. Um, and so it was really cool to see the different athletes cooling strategies. Um, 
I used some cooling strategy during my own 100k. I had a cooling towel that I would wrap around my neck, wrap around, you know, wherever I thought needed to be cooled down. But, um, it was... It was cool seeing the different, like you can buy hats that you can put ice in that hang down the back or ice on the top. I'm also talk about athletes carrying ice in their hands, very specifically carrying ice in their left hand because the idea being that whenever your heart pumps blood out, how the circulation works is that your heart pumps blood, um, you know, through your arteries down your left side into your hand where it then turns, comes back up, and then goes through your heart again to be recirculated out through the rest of your body. And so if you're holding ice in your left hand, the idea behind it is that your blood can potentially get cooled down before it gets recirculated through the rest of your body. And so strategically holding the ice, even in like such a very specific hand, in order to try and maximize cooling um, your core temperature through cooling the blood before it even recirculates, which is something that was just insane. And I was like, I wouldn't have even fathomed that. Like, if I'm thinking about getting my core temperature down, I'm just throwing ice, like, you know, on my chest, on my back, on my neck, you know, wherever it may be. But just having the, the knowledge of the cardiovascular system and trying to implement strategic icing locations was really cool, too. Yeah, I mean... Let's not forget about the headbands that some of the runners pulled out. Um, you may have seen during the men's marathon Kipchoge, who may maybe it wasn't a good endorsement for the headband, but I don't think that's the reason he ultimately didn't, you know, become the, I believe it would have been fourth gold medal for the marathon. He was wearing a headband that literally had, I don't know exactly what the technology is, but they look like crystallized forms of ice that don't melt during the race, right? I, I looked up the headband earlier, it's like $200, but, um, you know, if you got the money and you want to stay cool, I'm sure it's a best-in-class device. Was Hassan Hassan, using that was, Hassan was too, so I mean, okay, like, so I think at least they, they, they yeah. got their marketing. Yeah. They, got their, they got a gold medal. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think that's interesting. I mean, we're seeing new things in the sport that are being brought in through the Olympics. Of course, there were a lot of new shoes that made the appearance. I know Nike had their new like cheetah print, um, either Vapor, I believe it was the Alpha Fly come out that a lot of the runners were wearing. So that was interesting to see too. Um, you know, and I think what was actually a little bit surprising though on the running product side, maybe there's like a specific reason why some sort of TV deal in place for this that prevents us from seeing it. But for whatever reason, we were not able to see like the supplementation that these runners were doing, which Especially during the marathon, I wanted to see what they were doing because I'm always kind of questioning my fueling strategy and not sure the best products to take. I mean, of course, there's influencers that promote them, which is great and helpful. However, when we see people who are running, you know, low two hours in the men and low to mid two hours in the women, you got to wonder, like, what are they doing when it comes to fuel? I think we saw like water bottles we passed that had perhaps carbs in them, but we didn't actually see the gels. So I don't know if they were like cutting that out or if the runners maybe didn't want the public to see what they were using. But I just thought that was pretty interesting too. Yeah, yeah. I every time that they're like, oh, so and so is getting fuel, I was like, what are they drinking? What are they eating? And every time it's like, and this white water bottle that has no label and no brand on it. And it's like, okay, <laughs> it's fine. But you know, sometimes people make their own supplement drinks too. So maybe they have their, maybe they're making something that is not even able to be sold. Um, maybe they, same with like the fuel. But at the same time, it's like, it's definitely kind of along the lines of Mean Girls. Like, I saw Regina George eat Muir. Like, <laughs> I want to eat Muir, you know? Like, yeah. I want to know what they're doing so that I can do it and succeed. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think the one area that, like, frustrates me, and it, it, it's more, like, of me trying to express a tip, is that you might be watching some of these races after this podcast and wanting to reflect on what we saw. Now, I think, like, the races, like, the 1500, even the 5K, like, fueling during those races isn't necessarily something that you need to do when it comes to like fuel during the run however like most of the olympics like it doesn't really 
put on display like the fueling strategy of these athletes and promote that and like the, again the marathon it was like disappointing to not see that and so just know like you do need to fuel to like run your best and successful race there's science to back that up and like especially when you're out there for for multiple hours i mean these runners you know are running low two hour marathons when you're doing it upwards of three hours which you know 99 percent of us are um there's a lot more calories probably being burnt on your side and so to fill that in with carbs and electrolytes and all those areas i think that's something to not forget about there Something that I think is important to keep in mind is that hydration is not as simple as like you need to drink more water because if you drink too much water and you don't have enough electrolytes, you're actually going to end up dehydrated <laughs> or overhydrated. You're going to dilute the electrolytes in your bloodstream and that's dangerous. But if you drink only electrolytes and you're not sweating out the electrolytes and you're not drinking in water, you're going to get dehydrated because then you're going to have too many electrolytes and not enough water to balance it out in your bloodstream. And so it's like... It's interesting because it's not just about being hydrated. It is so much harder <laughs> than that to figure out how much sodium you're losing, how much potassium you're losing, how much X, Y, and Z, you know, can I take this salt tablet? If I take this salt tablet, how many sips of water do I need to take? And then when can I drink my Gatorade or my Tailwind or my special fuel again? And it's just really hard. <laughs> Regarding things that could be implemented as well that I thought was really notable during the Olympics was the collaboration and teamwork that you actually see in track and field. Now, relays aside, I'm talking about like individual races because we, we all view running as such an individual sport. However, like your competitors will build you up and allow you to run harder, but also seeing a familiar face, a friend that you've been training with in your same nation um, is definitely another way to build in another gear and just have that motivation going. Running is such a mental sport. And so little things like that, seeing a family member in a crowd or, you know, a certain song playing, it just does special things to the brain. And so, you know, during the U.S. men's marathon, um, there was the two men that came in eighth and ninth, I believe, from the U.S. The two of them did all their training together. They finished pretty much at the same time during the trials. They, like I said, were eight, nine in this race. So I know they like pushed each other to have a really strong showing for Americans, but you know, in other races too, we, we saw a lot of that collaboration in, in the 1500 and in other races. So I guess moral of the story here that I'm trying to share with folks is that, you know, if you're having a hard time like committing to running, staying consistent with running, if you're not reaching your racing goals, well, I think socializing the sport a bit individually for yourself and, you know, finding people who have this shared interest, who, you know, is similar ability to you, maybe a little bit better than you, is going to help push you to that, that next notch. Um, you know, I think having a pacer is a huge thing that you could do if you have the opportunity to do it as well. Um, a coach, whatever that might be, but having someone motivate you in the race or outside of the race makes a huge difference, which I know all these Olympians, they have their cast members for that. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, the camaraderie between Nagus and Hawker and how Nagus is like, hey, I mean, if Hawker's going for it, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to try. We saw it in a lot of teams, too. We saw teams definitely pulling, pulling a lot of strategy. I, I can't remember exactly what race it was, but one of the women's races the athletes from Ethiopia were definitely talking some strategy, trying to block out a lot of the other runners. They tried to um, string out to to keep the first, second, and third place a bit staggered to make it harder for other countries to get in. And um, also talking, there was always just a lot of talking to, I think, about not only did the two American runners that Sam was mentioning run together, but, you know, during the Olympic trials, they had a conversation as to who would get, <laughs> was it first and second, or second and third? Like, they had a conversation as to who got what place. Um, so it's not even just running together, but just, like, really showing the friendship aspect of it. For sure. Well, I think, you know, now that we spoke about this year's Olympics... I think it could be really awesome to talk about 
what's to come leading up to the 2028 Olympics, I guess, like, as viewers from our side. And also, maybe we could do another fun top three as well. I'm thinking of, like, wish list items that we have for the 2028 Olympics, whether they're realistic or not. We'll kind of talk through those. And so, you know, I think, like we shared earlier, for me, and I, I feel like you feel the same way, we were able to really connect deeper to the sport outside of what we do individually with the sport. So I look forward to, you know, continuing to track these athletes and continue to learn about new stories, upcoming runners, all of that. I mean, I think there's a lot of great to come within this sport. And I know we were talking earlier about it today. I mean, there's another big 1500 meter race coming up. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so there's essentially kind of like a rematch of the top uh, four guys that we mentioned from the 1500 earlier. So Britson, Kerr, Nagus, uh, Hawker, and they are going to be rematching in September as part of the Diamond League series, I believe. Is that yeah, right? no, that's yeah. correct. Um, and like I said, this was uh, this was the race that we were talking about earlier, in which Kerr and Ingebrigtsen were like the clear like clear favorites for it, and then they both were outran by Hawker, um, and Nagus was not far behind. <laughs> so. <laughs> Seeing seeing this rematch will be really interesting, um, and it'll be very exciting, very exciting to see, and it'll be one of, I think, one of the first, you know, track and field events that Sam and I are going to try and catch, like, either live or pretty well, you know, as soon as it's available <laughs> on YouTube or something, um, and so... That'll be really interesting. That's definitely something that, you know, we've talked about how we really enjoy watching the sport, and now we're wanting to try and follow it a bit more, and this is one of the next big races for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, like, pretty rare that I think in certain sports that when we talk about individual sports, to have four people who came in the top four in their event coming back and having a rematch, and, you know, kudos to Cole Hawker. You know, he could enjoy this summer enjoy this fall and just party it up after the gold medal but he wants to prove that he is the best 1500 meter runner in the world and consistently improve i know that they're all probably chasing the world record i believe they're only a, a couple seconds away from that so i think that's the next goal but you know, all of them are, are reasonably young enough where a return to the 2028 olympics um, I don't want to guarantee it for each of them, but it is definitely in the cards. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I think as well, we mentioned that the the world record is up. There's definitely talk of all of them running within, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of a second away from the world record. But something that will be different with this upcoming race that makes that world record an even more likelihood of being broken is that there will be pacers for part of this race. And pacers in a running context will be someone who runs and keeps the pace or sets the pace or runs at a specific pace in order for the runners to, like, keep their own pace. Yeah. Um, do they, this might sound like a silly question, but do they have, like, a live pacer or do they have, like, you know, like a car or, like, a laser yeah, so or something that, like, goes around? It ranges on the race, but typically it's probably going to be, like, one, two, or three runners that will run most likely the first two it's or three two, laps. I think. Um, so we got two? I think so. Oh, okay. I'm pretty positive. Yeah, and so if you've ever watched like a, a shorter race and you've noticed that any of the leaders have dropped out, you won't see it in the Olympics, but take races that are non-Olympic races, people will see that and they'll be like, oh, what happened to the leader? But no, that person was pacing. A great runner who's like probably was a professional or professionally runs, but the duty for the day was just to pace the race and make sure that these runners aren't going out too fast as well as too slow. And, you know, the cool thing about pacing, though, there's also, like, new technology in certain tracks now where you can see, like, a light. It yeah. almost looks like a dash that's electronic, and it'll essentially beep, 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 beep up the track, and if you follow the light that light is for a record, right? Whether that's like, typically they'll set that for like the world record in, in a race like this where that's an opportunity. Um, I don't know if we'll see a world record from them, but I mean, it's, it's a tough one, but it would be awesome to see it, you know?
Yeah, yeah, and I definitely think that we can, we can count, as long as everyone stays healthy um, and still has, you know, fires within them, I definitely think we could see all these people at another Olympics. Um, so as far as, you know, the three things that we want to see. Yeah, top three things, and I would say, like, it could be about running, but also it could just be about, like, the general organization of the Olympics, knowing that it's going to be in our homeland country of the United States, but specifically in L.A. Three things we want to say. Um, so my first, like, two things are kind of similar to one another. Um, one, I would like to, I guess, advocate for the continuance of there to be gender equity. <laughs> um, I really liked the fact that 50% of the athletes were, um, were female, 50% were male. Um, there were some people who were trans athletes, um, in different sports, and I still just appreciated the equality of that because I think that that opened up that opens up more um more role models for just little girls in sports um you know we saw a lot of women who did a lot of body positivity throughout the Olympics we saw the U.S. women honestly kick ass the U.S. women won like 60 percent of Either all medals in the U.S. or sixty percent of 60 like gold, gold medal. Gold. Yeah, sixty percent of the gold medals in the United States, which is crazy. Um, and so that's something that I would like to see is just the continuance of that. This kind of goes along with it. Um, Sam and I were talking about this, but the the hype for the men's one hundred meter race versus the marked lack of hype for the women's 100 meter race was very jarring <laughs> and very sad. Albeit there was a lot of rain that was going on for the women's 100, it was delayed for a little bit, but like they still get, if they wanted all those flashing lights like they had for the men's 100, they could have done that with the lights or with rain. Um, Do you want to like explain? Like, yeah. So if someone like, didn't watch it, they probably don't know. Yeah, so before the um, before the events, they have people called out by, um, they kind of, do, there's like a tunnel and they like call their name out and they like, they run out, they walk out, they wave, they do whatever. Um, this is where Noah Lyles is famous for like making his grand entrances. But the women's like call out was like, they called them out. It was like not this big deal. It was raining and it had gotten delayed. It wasn't like. You know, it was just like, oh, yep, they're doing, they're doing the 100. Uh, watch the women go fast. <laughs> um, and it was like, it was still treated as a race, but the men's 100 was treated as like an event. Like, not a race. It was like a entrance to like a concert is what um, these athletes got, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, people are coming out, there's like, I think they even had like a smoke machine. Do they have a smoke machine? Um, yeah, they may have had that for the women's too. I think the big picture was that they provided like a presentation where they turned off the lights and then they had they like had a bunch of strobe lights. lights. Everywhere. That was what the, the big difference was. And then like the announcement was toned up at a different level. I mean, the that whole, the whole track froze when the hundred for the men happened whereas for the woman it was another event there was probably like the long jump going on too yeah. and so they didn't freeze the rest of the track for that event yeah and not that the men should not deserve the hype the women should deserve that hype too my honest opinion and, and i agree with you however i'm going to take it like a little bit of a step further i don't understand why this can't be something that is done in every single race so yes it should be done in the if it's going to be done in the men's 100 it should be done in the women's 100 too but if it's being done in those races i mean it is not a ridiculous ask to show that level of respect to any of the events that are going on and we all you know we the whole theme of this podcast 
to a degree has been giving track more recognition, being able to grow and expand the sport. And you have a really good opportunity before a race to have someone to have someone's attention stay on the race, to get someone excited and get goosebumps before a race. And calling out people, while that is traditional and special, there can be more done within this sport to have more eyes on the prize. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, I think third, I think third, I, this is almost just, it is, this is more related to the, the IOC. Um, the Olympics have historically resulted in a lot of things, a lot of buildings, a lot of, a lot of stadiums, a lot of hotels, dormitories, all these things being built and then ultimately like never used again. Um, and that's problematic in its own sense, but we saw, we saw this Olympics try to minimize, um, some of the waste by having their athletes sleep on cardboard, right? And these cardboard beds and rest is essential for your body. It is essential for your mind. It is essential for all things and good sleep is where that really starts. And so I think it would be fantastic if, um, you know, the Olympics committee was able to provide athletes with beds and also then find a way to donate those beds to a shelter, to a college, to a military base, to, you know, anyone in need, right? Parents who have kids who want to graduate to a new bed size, but they can't afford it. These things. I think that there are ways in which you can repurpose and reuse these materials in a way that can greatly benefit the community. Um, and I think that that can also kind of translate to not just putting band-aids over issues in different host cities, for example, cleaning a river that hasn't been safe to clean it, it's just swim in for over a hundred years, um, for a couple of days. Like you're spending millions of dollars to do this for a couple of days and like the community could have benefited from that over these past hundred years. And so while I think that there is a lot of great that comes from the Olympics, I think that there is something to be said about looking into ways in which the production that goes into making the Olympics great is done in a way that helps the community long term and is more sustainable. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with that and I don't think there's much else to say on that topic. I think it's common sense, but it's often not done because it just seems the people who are in charge don't really care, unfortunately. Um, maybe they do, but it, yeah, I feel like we don't hear enough about what, you know, first of all, the athletes aren't getting, yeah, good, comfortable situations, but there's a lot of waste in the Olympics. We, we all know that. And a lot of money typically somehow lost. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll jump in here. You know, I think one area that would be a no-brainer and huge to see is just when we talk about like the overall viewing experience from someone who's not actually at the Olympics, right? Like we're talking about people who are at home watching on television, watching on their computers, their iPhones, Android devices, whatever you have. Being able to like have more information about what's actually going on, right? I felt like there was a lack, for example, like in the marathon of understanding what is going on in the entire race. We saw the first few runners that are winning, but we don't know their splits on each mile. Like they're the runners who were 20th and back. We don't know what's going on with them. Like the lack of like statistics and analytics of what's actually occurring when we talk about the overall broadcast, it's just insane to me. I mean, you think of all the top sports, they're throwing every stat in the world at you. I don't know why they can't do the same when it comes to running. And, like, I think it also ties with, like, and I'll consider this my second, 
just like the overall information about these athletes and being able to spread more like I want to know like what everyone is taking nutrition wise like I want to like hear from you know hear more about like what they're wearing what their training looks like hear their advice for runners and have them step up more as give you know people that can give back and I'm not saying that the runners don't do that but I'm saying that the way that the Olympics shares that information does not seem strong and so I would love to see that being more publicized as well. Yeah, something that drove my mind, information about the runners, I think not just focusing on those top people, but there was a time whenever I was watching the women's marathon where there was a runner and her last name was Suzuki and she was in the lead pack for a very long time. And to my recollection, the only time in which she was really referenced was whenever she was running downhill very quickly and didn't have perfect form. And the announcers were like, ah, yes, Suzuki, not great form. And then, like, they didn't mention her the rest of the race, during which time she held her own with this lead pack up until, like, the last maybe two kilometers of the race. And then she was able to run and finish strong by herself. She was completely separated from any of the pack which is incredibly hard to do, and there just, like, wasn't any discussion about Suzuki. Like, I wanted to know who this woman was. She was kicking butt. Like, I want to know about her. Um, and it just wasn't provided, which yeah. is unfortunate. No, for sure. And I mean, yeah, there's definitely people who are being left out as far as, like, the overall conversation on them. But, like, it, it doesn't always just have to be conversation. It can be visuals. Like, it would be great to see, like, on the side, there's plenty of room on the TV to do it. Like, them showing percentages, like, predictions of who's gonna come in the top three in the races and as the races are going the odds and the math is changing behind it like we have the technology to do those things you want people to stay on and watch a two-hour marathon we'll like do things to make this more interactive for the fans have fans be we able to <laughs> what we have the technology we do we have the technology as well to show miles per hour and kilometer per hour or like yeah this is a five minute mile which is like a 330 minute kilometer whatever yeah. that translates to let people <laughs> from around the world vote on who they think is going to win the race and have it through the broadcasting company and then have a sweepstakes whoever predicts the winner you know we're going to give out one pair of these athletes shoes or, or whatever it is it doesn't have to be shoes it could be like a freaking goo packet for all i care but like just give people a reason to watch. Like, yeah. have fun with it. Be creative. These are things, like, I easily thought of. And I'm not working for these companies. I just think that, like, it can't just be a race on a TV. It needs to be an at-home viewing experience that is engaging for the people. If you're at the Olympics, it's going to be awesome. So I'm sure they do a fine job there. You know, we've already talked about wanting to go. And so... It's going to be great to see potentially what it feels like to be a fan of these, but you know, you want to have something that people stay and watch. You got to do things like that. The third thing that I would just love to see in, in 28 though, is just a lot of comeback stories and folks that we have like connected with this year in this Olympics to make their way back. I mean, I think it would be awesome to see, Lyles hit the 100, 200, and 4 by one in gold. Like, I think he completely has the potential to do that. You know, it might be his, like, last Olympics that he has the ability to win multiple events when we talk about his age. I'd love to see Shikari Richardson um, be able to rebound and win the 100. I want to see the high schooler, uh, Quincy Wilson, right? Yes. Or, yeah, this is with Quincy Hall. There's so, many, there's so many Quincy. I want to see Quincy Wilson compete for a gold medal in the 400. At that point, he'll be 20 years old. I mean, he's got potential to do that. I want to see Hawker and the rest of those folks come back in the 1500. I'd love to see Kipchoge, like, try to rebound at 43 and compete for a medal. So, you know, Keanu I don't know. Keith to come back, finish. Yeah. Finish her Olympic marathon. Um... I think Mo to be able to make it. She this was supposed to be her comeback year, and 
come back, come back, come back. Yeah, you know? I mean, there was a lot of Jamaican sprinters who dropped out of races as well, um, as well as other countries. But I'm bringing up Jamaica because I, I believe they had two runners who dropped out of races, and they're always like a big threat. You know, I, I have, of course, like I root for the U.S., but I want the U.S. to have the best competition. If they have the best competition, maybe we're not many, winning as many medals, but the times in these races are going to be stronger. So yeah, and I mean, I would. We, we had a couple of world records be broken, but I think in 28, with how strong the U.S. is, having the home field advantage, why not see the most records being broke like in the 21st century? I think that's something that could be possible. And it's a big ask when we had Usain Bolt run a lot of the 21st century and break a ton of records. All right, well, we have been talking a lot about some amazing topics, but I think it's time to call it a night on the podcast. What do you say, Colleen? I think so. I think so. This has been great. A great kickoff. You know, season two, episode one. Maybe we'll have another 75 episode season. Who knows? Yes, and, um, you know, I think a lot of these episodes are going to be focused on, you know, me and Colleen speaking to you all. However, like, you can expect potentially some guests joining the podcast as well. We'll kind of see how that goes. I know we all love bringing on the guests, but it's, it's always good to have a conversation in person, which is what we're really trying to promote. It's not always easy to get folks out to Denver, but we'll see. You know, I think we're going to have a lot of surprises, a lot of fun things that we'll incorporate in these episodes. So let us know your feedback, what you think of this new model. would love to hear that as well as just things that you'd like to see in the podcast. Um, as a reminder, you know, run brighter. It's not just a podcast. I'm on all forms of social media from Instagram to TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. And I actually recently just created a LinkedIn page because while I am a hardworking professional in my full-time job, I do think that in that business community can share some great things when it comes to running. So that's kind of the spiel there. Um, if anyone needs a custom running plan, reach out to me directly or head to runbrighter.com and you'll have the opportunity to do that. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is we appreciate five-star ratings on the podcast, subscribe, all that, as it allows us to grow the podcast, get in front of more faces with the messages that we are trying to share about running. And yeah, we all love that. Yeah, absolutely. And friends, don't forget to run brighter. Yes, good call. All right, have a good one.